What's up, everybody? It's Soren Baker here on Unique Access Entertainment. As always, please hit that subscribe button. It's right down there and it's free. That enables us to keep coming to y'all as often as possible with as many interviews as possible. So please hit that subscribe button, like our content, share it, talk about it, be about it, each one, teach one, and we appreciate your support in getting us this far. Today, we have the honor and privilege of being joined by somebody I've been wanting to talk to for a long time. So I'm glad the day is finally here. Yomo from Yomo Maki. Thank you for coming through, sir. Oh, well, thank you for having me, brother. Long yeah. time coming. Yes, very, very excited. So, of course, we got to talk about a lot of your work. But as I came later, as I was playing catch up, as I do throughout my life with the mm-hmm. rap history, the Dizo Daz song is what really threw me off. The, it's my turn because when I heard Yomo and Malky in 91, I didn't know about that yet. So it was a little bit later I found about that that was you, I should say. Yeah, so, Dizzo Daz. Yes. So, so many questions right off the bat from that. So yeah. how did you get with Unknown and Slip to do It's My Turn? Well, you know, man, I went to school with O'Shea, right? That's, so, ice, that's ice Cube. That's ice Cube, yeah. Know. And, uh, and uh, you know, he, he had hooked me up. We was really the only ones rapping, really, in those days at school. So he hooked me up with, with his cousin, jinx right who was who who was uh living right across the street from dark from dr dre right so dre really didn't have time to really do nothing with me because he had cia and you know making all the parody records that they was making back in them days and you know he was part of uh of um lonzo's little crew you know little crew of djs you know what i'm saying so he kind of kind of slid me over there to the unknown, man. You know, I was a 17 year old kid, man. I did, I really didn't know what was going on. I was just happy to like, uh, have a record, you know, uh, I can remember being on the bus on, on a school bus on the way home from school. And man, I tell you three or four times on K-Day, 1580 K-Day, man, they would play my song before I even got home. Wow. It's my yeah. turn was getting that much burn on K-Day. Oh, absolutely. Cause it wasn't that much soaring. You gotta, you gotta keep in mind that it wasn't that much uh, uh, hip hop. They didn't have a lot of stuff to play right. in those days. So yeah, man, I was definitely getting the, you know, spins as they would call it. Yeah. And I remember too, with it's my turn with Stizo and then Dizo Daz, I was like, man, it's, it's my turn. Uh, <laughs> this uh-huh. is crazy. Uh-huh. But uh, lyrically, I was interested because on it's my turn, the it's mainly boasting, I would say, if not totally just braggadocio. And then with oh, the old- oh, absolutely. I mean, that's you know, that record came out in 1987. That's kind of all you had, you know what I'm saying? Like, and, and it was very, if you really pay close attention to it, this is kind of before the whole West Coast style. So, like, you know, that record was really a, a East Coast style record. Yeah, I, I would agree. And ironically, for the West Coast side of things, the six in the morning being released on the same label. Same, also, yeah, on the same record label on Techno Hop. Yeah. Shout out uh, to Unknown Techno Hop. Yeah, also with Unknown, of course. But I just find it so hilarious that people, and I try to explain this in my book, The History of Gangster Rap, but it's like right. before really schooly d influence ice t and then we get the shift with six in the morning and then boys in the hood but right you know when you listen to earlier techno hop you listen to king t all these other people that were around frost mm-hmm. etc even ice t himself they were not uh-huh. rapping like schooly d or six in the morning it was no not, not at all <laughs> no not at, not at all do you remember uh low profile of course pay your dough see a dj lad you hey, see you how do. Dub rapped in those days? Yeah. He was, it was like he was an East Coast rapper, kind of like, right? Yeah, but remember, they also had the song Why We Do It, and they were explaining things that was right. That's that right. Was, That's that, right. And as you're well aware, the thing is with Aladdin in low profile, there was so much scratching, which was done because of obviously emulating the East Coast of that as well. Absolutely. As, 
as we get with Bobcat on Bigger and Deffer. Right, right. So I say all that to say it's just shocking that kind of like the myth that rap was always conscious and all this. No, it wasn't. And no, then it wasn't. No, it, it wasn't. It wasn't for years. And then right. the myth that L.A. was always gangster. No, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Um, no, it wasn't. Hey. Hey, there's a record. There's a record on the Straight Outta Compton album called "Panic Zone." Well, there's also that, a song on that is not, that is not a gangster record. Let's just let's just say that. Well, I got another one for you. Remember something to dance to? <laughs> yes, this is something to dance to. See, that was L.A. hip hop before Easy E or Six in the Morning. Man, let me let me say this. I don't think, I don't think we here in LA looked at Six in the Morning as a gangster record. I don't think we did. Just, I don't think we really started looking at and, and, and maybe even calling it gangster rap until Easy Does It, man. You mean you the album? The album, right? The album, Easy Does It, yeah. Which is because, two because years before that, LA LA rap was. Some to dance to, Panic Zone, you know, world class record crew. Shout out to Blonzo. Yeah, and it's to all those points. That's what made "It's My Turn" by you so striking. When I then heard "Are You Experienced," and then I realized it was you and all this stuff because I was like, "Man, that's a very huge evolution, stylistically, lyrically, your voice, your rhymes, just everything." Mm-hmm. So, uh, how did you get? Or what was the other name from the the Dizo Daz? Where did that come from? Hmm. Man, listen. I think I might have been, you know, with, with, with some friends. Uh, shit, it's probably had to be 80. I was probably 15 years old. And, you know, walking up, uh, walking through Hollywood as we did back in the days, you know, can't do that so much now. But, man, I think I saw this kid. Like, he had to be from New York, man. Had to be. Because he had... You know, back in them days, the B boys, how they had the belt buckles that said their name. The name. Man, this plates. kid, his, his, it said Deza, and I was like, "That's it," and that's how I got my name. I bit that from some random ass kid walking down Hollywood Boulevard, and I became Dezo Dash. Hmm. That that's simple. Crazy. And then with a slip, what? Because uh, unknown obviously had techno hop, and then Slip was doing a lot of stuff too. But what mm-hmm. what was your relationship with Slip at this time? Uh, you know, S- unknown put me with Slip. Okay, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know Slip. I unknown, I got one unknown, and he wanted to make a record, and you know, he had this DJ that you know we was gonna make the record together because Slip did the beat, and yeah, man, unknown put all that together, and then through that. Me and Slip, you know, we kicked it a little bit, but Slip was Slip was a lot older than me. You know what I'm saying? I was, dude, I was, I was a kid. You know, Slip was probably when that record came out, I was 17, man. Slip had to easily be 25. Oh wow. Yeah. Or, you know, somewhere, you know, give or take a few. You know what I mean? So, you know, we weren't really in the same peer group. Gotcha. But then also in the lyrics, you mentioned that you're Yomo in the song. Oh, I know. So do you remember why why you wanted to do that? Nah, I don't. I mean, you know, I'm 17 years old. I don't remember why I, why I wanted to say, you know, I'm just Yomo. I remember that too, man. Um, nah, I really don't remember why. It's okay. probably just sounded cool. Gotcha. Because I didn't know what that meant until when i was hearing it later i was like okay he's mentioning his name but then why was his name different i was just right so, right so confused. yeah yeah i gotta tell you man i don't even know what made me um decide to stop being desolate Dads and just be yo hmm. i really don't know what the catalyst for that was but uh you know apparently it happened right clearly So what's, Mm -hmm. what's the, what is the origin of your name from your parents? Like, what is that? How did that come? Uh, The year that I was born, the president of Kenya was Jomo Kenyatta. And my parents just took the J off and added a Y. Hmm. 
Are they same thing with my brother too. I got a brother named Yosef instead of Joseph. Are your parents Kenyan? No, okay. they're from Chicago, brother. <laughs> <laughs> well, there we have it. There we have there it. We have it. Now it's my turn. I would argue is most famous for the Compton's in the house at the end. Right. So did. Uh, you guys are just talking at the end of the song as the song fades out. So mm -hmm. did anything special or noteworthy or why did you guys end up doing that? Just talking at the end like that. Um, no, we, no, we weren't talking. It was like shout outs at the end. Remember? Well, I mean, you weren't, yeah, you, uh, you weren't in song mode, quote unquote. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't, yeah, I don't think it was any, anything special, but I, I got a, I got an interesting story as to what, because listen, I didn't live in Compton. I'm not from Compton, but you know, one would ask, well, man, why don't you say Compton's in the house? Let me tell you why. Because I know him is from Compton. And he was like, you should, you should say it like this, because at that time it was a real famous, I forget the record, but in the record they would go, is Brooklyn in the house? So it was kind of like, Again, with the whole East Coast thing, you know, mock, uh, mocking, mocking them, right? So instead of Brooklyn's in the house, it was Compton's in the house. That's why we did that. Okay. It's really based on is Brooklyn in the house. Makes sense. Yeah. Makes sense. I, I tried to say it like, you know, they said it, right? Mm hmm Okay. <laughs> so then that's 87. Mm -hmm. And then over the next couple of years, why didn't you do more with uh, Techno Hop and Unknown, and how then did you get with Easy? Well, you know, I wrote that, that record came out in October of 87, which by June of 88, I'm graduating high school, and then by September of, of 88, I went away to college, man. And- Where'd you go? Uh, Sacramento State University. Okay, what were you studying? So, so uh, say that again? What were you studying? And nothing. Women? <laughs> <laughs> Women. <laughs> Basketball. You know, being away from home for the first time. But, you know, uh, Eric, easy -E, slowly, you know, co coerced me back, man, to, uh, to make a record. And I ended up signing with Ruthless Records in 88, but the RU Experience record didn't come out until 91. So for like, you know, three years, man, I was just signed over there with nothing really happening. So what made you sign and what made nothing happen for a couple of years? Um, well, what made me sign is, is the money that Eric put in front of my face, which was really no money, but I was a 19 year old kid. So it was some money to me. Right. Um, and uh they were too, Eric was too busy and Dre was too busy working on the NWA record, the uh, Easy Does It record, uh, JJ Fad, like all those records that came out, you know, Above the Law, DLC, all those records came out before us. So that's what took so long. It was like, it was like this order that they had, all right, you up next, you up next. So. Okay. That side went down. Now, those are some phenomenal records, so it's understandable. But mm -hmm. did you sign? I'm definitely a good company. For sure. Now, initially, did you sign as a solo artist? No, me and Marquis signed. So how, how did you guys connect? We went to school together. And then what we made was We was rapping. We was, we was rapping when I was Dezo Daz. It was Dezo Daz and Marky Freeze. But, uh, you know, when an when unknown approached me, he just wanted to, you know, put out a solo, solo record with me. So, you know, I had to go, go back to my brother and be like, hey, man, listen, what you think? You think I should do that? He's like, man, go, go get it. So we was always rapping together. You know what I'm saying? Since, since, uh, since high school. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. And then with nothing happening, what, I mean, did, uh, what was the catalyst to finally have Easy say, yo, Yella, go produce Yomo Malki? What happened? You know, man, on that end, I really don't know. I just know I got a phone call one day, like, 
hey, come down to the studio. Let's start recording. And that was Yella that called you or easy? It, it was easy. And but, but, you know, I don't really remember this, but, you know, me and Marquis, we, we talk often. And, uh, you know, he tells me that initially Dre was supposed to produce my record. But I but we think that because he was on his way out, you know, leaving Rufus, because you got to remember, I, well, I remember that my record was being recorded at the exact same time Niggas for Life was being recorded. Like, Yellow would do that by, by no, he would record our record by day. We, like, we had a certain amount of hours, and it was all like audio achievements. You know, everything that, that came out of Rufus Records, as you well know, was recorded at audio achievements in Torrance. Um, so, you know, we had maybe four or five hours every day. So we would record and then we would, I mean, we, we wouldn't have to leave, but our session would be over. And Dre and all of them would come in and, and they'll be recording Niggas for Life. So I think that like Dre was on his way out and he just really didn't have the time or, or like really the desire to, to, to do another record over there. You know what I'm saying? Right. So uh yeah let's step in okay mm-hmm. and then i do think generally speaking yellow's significance is extremely underrated but right. for you what did you see were some of yellow's strong points some of his strengths well he was a hell of a programmer you know he knew how to program them drum machines you know there were no computers in those days the computers were actually in the drum machines you know that he was a hell of a program because that's what he did for Dre. You know, when, as they produced, Dre would have these ideas, but but I don't think Dre knew how to technically put them together. Yellow was really good at that. Really, really good at programming drums and having stuff stop here and come in there. And he was really, really good at that. Yeah. So that's what I saw. Okay. Gotcha. Now, as the the album you guys started working on, are you experienced? Did you get that title initially, or did that come later in the process? Oh, that was yeah, that was initially. Me and Mark, we, me and Marquis, we talked about that. You know, when we put out an album, what is it going to be called? So, yeah, and, you know, that was that was the Jimi Hendrix record. And what uh, what drew you to Jimi Hendrix so heavily? <sighs> I'm smoking a lot of weed. <laughs> to be honest with you as you somebody know. that's as somebody that's never smoked weed i'll have to take your word for it so yeah right right so what what was it about that experience that made are you experience so uh great for you musically um that's a really good question uh man you know just to be in there and 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 coming up with things and getting them down on tape and i had i mean really the only experience i'd ever had was making that one single for for techno hop and uh you know now i i got a chance to like make this whole album so it was just that thing too man you know and again i was very young so i didn't really have any uh major outlook on um on like my career or anything like that like i think for us what was the most important thing for me and Marquis was that KRS One and Chuck D and Big Daddy Kane thought that we was dope. That's all we really cared about. Be sure to check out the history of gangster rap by Soren Baker. He's official. History of gangster rap features exclusive interviews with Ice T, Snoop Dogg, MC Ren, the DOC, and dozens of others. The history of gangster rap, a definitive look at how Los Angeles changed rap forever. In Los Angeles, the streets definitely set the tone of the hip hop music. I'm 19, I got a $50,000 car. My whole angle always was I'll be street, but I will always tell you the horrors that go along with this life. There will be penalties and casualties for just wearing the wrong color in somebody's neighborhood. And once gangster rap made it from the streets to the TV, the genre exploded. What's that five on your TV basketball? Your MTV it just catapulted us from being local heroes to national 
gangbang rappers. The history of gangster rap discusses it all from 1980 up till today. It's always gonna be shit happening in the streets. You know what I mean? So it's always gonna be something to talk about. The history of gangster rap in stores now.